doesn't say much, but he sure is cute. <laughs> he didn't laugh at that, so he must not have heard you. <laughs> blowing with his trunk and spraying at a blast of about 35 miles an hour and then painting. And then I do the endangered species, the earth, would you like to take that, Kathy? And um, a border that relates either to the indigenous peoples closely connected to the endangered species or some other symbolism like all of the other or many of the other organisms within their uh, biodiverse area. So most of them are focused on the biodiversity hotspots based on IUCN research. And they all come from seeing, from meditation, from being quiet and letting the painting speak. It's something we call the magic of Rama happens. Okay, so how did Rama get to be painting? Yeah. <laughs> Not all elephants paint, right? Yeah. I mean, that is unusual. Rama is actually second generation American. He is an Indian elephant. Asian elephant and he was born and raised in the Oregon Zoo and he had, they had art classes for <laughs> elephants at the zoo. I mean this is Oregon. You know in the days when Charlie the chimp was at the Oregon Zoo they figured out how important enrichment was. So it's stimulation of mental and emotional faculties as well as keeping them physically fit in a captive environment. And you know people have all kinds of opinions about zoos but basically uh, zoo, all the animals in the zoo have a story of how and why they got there. They're blind or their parents were killed or something awful happened to have them wind up there. They're not just captured. So, so Rama had had an injury and he needed some stimulation. And he loved spraying the keeper's legs. So to use that <laughs> skill, Cheb thought, well, why not put a little non-toxic paint in there, some children's watercolor, some children's yeah. tempera. And lo and behold, they started painting, and what came out was, it's uncanny, really. It's, it's almost unbelievable, and I don't even use that word, to see the beauty and the sophistication that comes out on these canvases. I was astounded. Okay, so talk a little bit about process, if you don't mind. Um, I was the docent for a long time ah. in a museum. So um, uh, who picked the colors? Did Rama get to pick mm. the colors? I like, I like that question. I got to pick the colors. So he did not get to pick the colors. So that's why I say it's a true collaboration. Some people have given, you know, Asian elephants, um, you know, a paintbrush to paint. But I got to pick a palette of paint based on an ecosystem or a species or a particular harmony and a feeling that I want to get across. This is all about art having power, art taking back its power. So, um, where were we right I was that? asking about um, the, the paint, um, how, how the palette came together. Oh, yes. Thank so you. Uh, you would give Rama uh, several buckets of paint? Right. So what happens was that based on this, an ecosystem or an endangered species and the feeling that I wanted to portray, I would mix up a bucket of small syringes, you know, a little tiny syringe, plastic tube, basically. And then Jeff would say to Rama, let me have your beat. And Rama was so excited to paint, his ears would be going. And then by watching the process of Rama taking the paint, blasting it onto the canvas, I could know intuitively which order of paint to choose. So I had already mixed up the palette. It took me three hours for setting up one painting where he would do a masterpiece in 15 minutes. I then would do things like paint the reef in 600 hours. So he would spend 15, 20 minutes. I could work for 600 hours on the same painting. So it's a little unfair, but you know, it's just absolutely awesome. And then at the end, we would often, depending on how it looked, and that was the pleasure and honor that I had, is mixing the color palette, seeing if the board had to be turned. Oh. I think 